we're going to call the meeting to order. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our third annual, our third special town meeting done virtually. Uh, we picked up much better last time. Everyone's getting the hang of it. We're uh, doing much better with the tech support side of it. They're having less and less to do each night. And we've refined a few things as we went, as Adam was saying. One of the issues we found out was um, when I would announce this voting, everybody would pop over to the voting portal and hit refresh page at the same time. And that just sort of overloaded the system. So we're gonna take a, a little slower approach at jumping from Zoom to the voting portal. If everyone can just take a cue from me when to jump over and then that should keep everybody on. We're also looking for a backside technical fix on that. And we're gonna see if that works this time around or um, next time we have a meeting. Um, our voting, all of our verbal voting is gonna be done off screen because a few folks thought that that might be influencing people's votes if they heard how someone else was voting. So we're do, handling that on the back end. Uh, we won't be announcing those votes live anymore, but they will be showing up in the voting records. And there was one other thing I was supposed to mention, but I forgot what it was. And I left my notes at the office. That's part of the problem, doing this from home. Um, all right, I'm assuming there are no more town meeting members that have to be sworn in. If any of them are, please give us a quick um, raise hand in the Zoom. If you could turn that on for one second, Julie, let's see if anyone raises their hand, they're not sworn in but everybody really should be at this point. Oh, we have one. Mr. Ruderman. Mr. Ruderman, have you not been sworn in? I was not aware of that. You raise your hand. I have? Yeah. I'll put it down for you and we'll pretend okay. you didn't do it. There you go. All righty. So everybody's raising hand. So um, I recognize the chair of the board of selectmen, John V. Hurd, the select board. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Hurd, select board chair. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the special town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, November 30th, 2020 at 8 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Foskett, would you like to second? Second. Second, okay, I'm gonna, so we're gonna uh, take Wednesday off because it's the day before Thanksgiving, everyone. We're gonna come back next Monday if we don't finish up tonight. Uh, so I'm gonna direct the clerk to enter one vote in favor of that motion. And I will now call if there are any announcements or resolutions. If anyone has an announcement or resolution? Um, I guess the uh, raise hand feature is still open. Now yes. it is. Now it is, okay. Raise your hand if you have an announcement or resolution. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Steve DeCourcy, Precinct 2, and a member of the Select Board. Uh, this past Saturday, the Somerville Homeless Coalition organized a cleanup of the homeless encampment in the Mugar Woods. There are 25 volunteers who participated in the cleanup, which resulted in the removal of two dumpsters full of trash. I want to acknowledge Mike Libby, Hannah O'Halloran, and other members of the Homeless Coalition for organizing the cleanup. Chief Flaherty, Captain Flynn and Officer Kniff of the Arlington Police Department for their participation and to Officer Kniff in particular for his ongoing work at the site as part of the multidisciplinary homeless outreach team. I also wanna thank numerous residents for their volunteerism and a special thank you to Congressman Joe Kennedy for his help and support. Through the cleanup, a significant step was taken to make the area safer for the homeless population and those members of the homeless outreach team who provide services on site. The cleanup also helped to provide insight as to how the town and the homeless coalition can continue to provide critical services with the goal of securing permanent housing for homeless individuals while also balancing 
neighborhood concerns. Finally, it demonstrated the clear need to seek the property owner's participation in future cleanup efforts. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. If we were in town hall, everybody would clap for you right now. That's not gonna happen here. Anyone else have an announcement or resolution? Okay, seeing none. I'm gonna recall for any reports of committees. Does anyone have a report of a committee or board that we haven't received already? Again, if they do, please use the raise hand feature. Um, Ms. Bloom has put a point of order up, Ms. Bloom. Um, let's ask Nancy what's her point of order. It's a little unusual this early in the meeting, but Ms. Bloom, what's your point of order? Um, Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. I was just wondering, someone mentioned a couple of meetings back that perhaps we should start half an hour earlier. And yeah, I that can't happen. I'll tell you why, Nancy. Um, the, the team logs on at seven o'clock and we start checking in everybody else by 7.15, 7.30 and it takes us till eight o'clock almost. So to get it to start earlier would push all of our dinners right off the page. Um, we, we entertained that out, but we'd have to actually um, reschedule everything on our our side of the screen here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Bloom. Okay, seeing no resolutions, board announcements, or any reports of committees. Um, we haven't taken one article one off the table, so we don't have to. Mr. Foskey, can you take article four off the table, please? Uh, Mr. Mr. Moderator, I move that the recommended votes contained in the respective reports of the Finance Committee Select Board, Redevelopment Board, and other committees be before the meeting without further motion. Thank you, sir. We'll direct I the move clerk. That, uh, Article 4, the bylaw amendment, uh, bikeway hours be taken off the table. Okay. Um, I need Ms. a second. Ms. Brazil can second that for us. Sorry, Julie Brazil, Precinct 12, second. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, we have 229 members logged in already. Very good. Um, all right, so we have Article 4 is off the table. Um, we have received, I have one question of uh, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd, did the uh, select board discuss Article 4 in their meeting this evening? And did they have a change of their vote? We did have a meeting this evening, Mr. Moderator. Did you discuss this article for at all? We did not. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, and I call uh, Patricia Muldoon. Oh, Patty was there. Then she went away. There she's back. Okay. All right. Muldoon. You can hear me now. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Patricia Muldoon, Precinct 20. I have submitted a substitute motion that in um, the legalese language basically would eliminate uh, restrictions on the Minutemen bikeway hours. And the reason I am proposing that, I will say that I have ridden the bike path uh, after night has fallen late into the night with my helmet light on. And I had no idea I was breaking the law. Who knew? It really should be changed to um, allow all of us to be able to use the bike path in, uh, it is a transportation quarter corridor so it's something that we should all be able to use as needed. As I understand it, it is rarely if ever enforced, but certainly unevenly enforced by the police. And they have other tools in their toolkit if there are any problems that arise. This one 
keeps us out of step as it is currently written, keeps us out of step with our Minuteman neighbors who do not have any curfew or limit on their bike hours. So it is a source of transportation. It should be open just as roads are open. It would help a little bit in meeting our sustainability goals because we want to encourage people to walk and bike rather than using fossil fuel cars. And it would improve, I think, the fairness and justice efforts that we are all undertaking, that it's not be something that is only a very occasionally enforced uh, with some people and the rest of us don't even know that it is a law. So I think in for fairness and to make us more compatible with our neighbors and hopefully more sustainable, I propose that we align with our neighbors and eliminate any curfew hours for the bike path. And I will mention that I have spoken with a couple of members of the Bicycle Advisory Committee and they have, uh, I, they tell me they've wanted to accomplish this for years. So I think it is about time that we change our uh, largely unknown law and make us compatible with our neighbors. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Muldoon. Mr. Foskick, we second Mr. Mul Ms. Muldoon's? Second. I second, yes. Okay, seconded, thank you very much. All right, um, as you may have noticed, we fixed the issue with the clock. Um, we had a, a glitch when Adam would uh, flick away from the waiting to speak screen and go to the um, screen showing us the warrant article and the proposed votes, et cetera. The clock would glitch. It's been fixed. So now it actually shows the time that it's supposed to show. Um, I think Ms. Bloom's point of order is done. So the next person would be Adam McNeil. Hello, uh, Adam McNeil, precinct four. I'm okay. Mr. McNeil. So, yes, great, good. <laughs> I know you said not to ask if you could hear me, but I didn't know it was to the All right, um, so I am, uh, the citizen sponsor of this article, uh, the original uh, warrant article, uh, which did not have uh, either the select board specific language or um, obviously um, Ms. Valdu's specific language, although it is it was written um, as a generic article on purpose for those purposes. Um, so I can give a little bit of brief history about this, uh, the article, and then also my uh, personal opinions on um, Ms. Muldoon's um, substitute motion, although I can't speak for the committee on the substitute motion uh, because we have not taken a vote on that, although obviously we took a vote of support of the uh, genericized Warren article language. Um, so the Minuteman bikeway uh, is obviously a pretty heavily used um, uh, thoroughfare, both for um, obviously for cycling, but also for walking, running. Um, I think one of the most frequent um, accidental violations of the current uh, curfew is uh, people walking their dogs. Uh, that was especially true uh, in 2019. I'm not sure if 2020's general change in everyone's behavior has massively affected that, but um, uh, that's uh, neither here nor there, I guess, suppose for going forward. Ideally, we'd be back to good con uh, conditions. Uh, but it, it's definitely very heavily used and it's very heavily used outside of the curfew hours uh, as are currently stated, uh, especially in the summer, but even in the winter. Um, and a lot of people are accidentally violating the law. Um, so the original goal of this warrant article was to do two things. One was to align the law with the actual usage uh, so that people were not accidentally violating the law. And the other was to kind of just clean up some um, areas of possible inconsistency. Um, I say the police were um, quite willing to talk to, with me about this. We came to a, a pretty good hammering out of their opinions on what they use the current curfew for. Um, and uh, we, I was very pleased to get their support on the, the warrant article uh, and the genericized language there. Um, 
uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, I Miss Muldoon went into pretty great uh, detail um, listing of a lot of the reasons why this makes a lot of sense, even outside of the fact that the law is uh, relatively inconsistently enforced it and a stretch really of resources. Um, but uh, oh shoot, where was I going with that? My apologies, <laughs> I just kind of lost my train of thought. Oh yes, uh, so as to what I was talking about, um, Miss Muldoon's motion as opposed to the select board's motion. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, I did not talk to Ms. Muldoon prior to her filing this motion, and I was actually rather surprised by it. But uh, honestly, I believe alignment with our neighboring communities, so we don't have, you know, you trigger when you cross the border, which, you know, isn't super clearly defined on the bikeway, uh, is ultimately the goal, anyway, to make things consistent, to make things clear, understandable, um, and to align with usage that's really, for the most part, not really causing any issues, uh, such like noise violations, if there's any serious issues on the bikeway, are already covered under their respective um, laws. The bikeway hours don't really make sense as a park. Uh, it's not used really as a park, except for that possible exception of dog walking that I mentioned earlier. It's a commuting path. It's safer for bikers and walkers to be on the bikeway than it is to be on the road for the most part. Um, especially the section by Alewife that's heavily lit and heavily used. Um, so on a personal note, I support um, Ms. Muldoon's uh, substitute motion, but I hope that uh, either way, uh, whether the substitute motion passes or not, uh, we can uh, work towards extending it with the uh, original if it doesn't. Um, so that's my preference order, uh, Ms. Muldoon's motion and then a passing as the compromise of the uh, select boards question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. Uh, Ms. Brazil, as a town meeting member. Yes, uh, Julie Brazil, precinct 12. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with the amendment. I'm very open to, to the idea of, um, of of reducing the uh, the restrictions on the bike path and aligning ourselves with the surrounding communities, I, I that makes sense to me. But I am concerned um, that 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 we aren't following a, a good process here. The abutters had no notice that this was being discussed. Um, there hasn't been a conversation. If if people have concerns um, that we 250 people haven't thought of, um, I just I'm concerned that we. It's 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 not it's not what we said when we mailed the warrant to people and put it up on online, um, and just sort of secondarily, it, it's I feel like we haven't quite learned the lesson from Article Three um, amendments from the floor that sort of substantively change things. I think um, can be dangerous, and we have to come back in a year and fix them. Um, and so um, I, I won't be supporting the amendment, um, but I'm very happy to support um, Article 4 and then encourage um, citizens or, or the relevant uh, you know, committees to, to propose, um, to propose a, a more complete solution for April. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brazil. And I, I do personally find that the uh, amendment is within the scope of the warrant article, which was to extend the operating hours. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Brazil. Um, Phil Goff. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Phil Goff, Precinct 7. Um, I, I had originally supported Article 4 as I thought um, giving the town manager flexibility to uh, add some additional hours onto the bikeway made a lot of sense, but um, I was enthused and actually uh, I rise in support of the substitute motion as well, um, as I think that, uh, you know, as Ms. Muldoon mentioned and, and Adam spoke to as well, I think it just makes sense as a transportation facility that it be open uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I think in 1992, when the, when the Miniman was uh, developed, uh, you know, my sense is it was probably thought more as a, a recreational facility. Uh, as, as a lot of rail trails and the Charles River Basin trail system was really thought of more for recreation. But I think that's really, that's changed, that's evolved in the 
28 years that the Minuteman Bikeway has been open uh, in Arlington. Certainly the uh, demand created by um, Alewife Station is a big part of that. We know that uh, a huge number of the people who are actually using the bikeway are in fact commuters um, as the town and the uh, regional planning agency has in East Arlington Liverpool Streets has done uh, counts over the years on the Minuteman. The, the biggest bikes are definitely um, uh, obviously in, in East Arlington as well are in the morning and, and p.m. So people are using it for commuting in both morning and the evening. Um, and I think having the uh, Minuteman open for people who are coming home uh, later at night from work or maybe they're out um, is not only fair uh, for people who are traveling on foot or by bike uh, or scooter, maybe as, as those are becoming more popular, but I also think it's very consistent with um, the, the master plan's uh, goals of promoting sustainable uh, transportation as well. So I think just, you know, imagine uh, if it was decided that, you know, Gray Street at 9 p.m. would be closed to through traffic and everyone had to use Mass Ave instead. Uh, when they're coming home late uh, or vice versa. Mass Ave closed at 9 p.m. Wouldn't really make any sense. Um, and I think the bikeway should really be um, treated the same way as a you know, really critical transportation corridor for the town of Arlington. I like the fact that it also uh, would allow us to be um, consistent and have similar policies to Lexington and Bedford. So someone who is taking perhaps a longer trip at night doesn't have to think about or worry about which town they're in and whether it's legal or illegal uh, for them to be uh, in that particular place at that particular time. So I do encourage um, all town meeting members to support the substitute motion and hopefully the Minuteman path one day will be available for anyone to use uh, 24 hours a day for transportation or recreation. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Goff. Mr. John Warden. Yeah. You can speak, Mr. Warden. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, town, fellow town meeting members, when the legislature authorized- Name the precinct. Oh, uh, John Warden, Precinct 8. <clears throat> when the legislature uh, authorized representative town meetings back in the 20s, we were one of the very early towns to do it. Uh, they specifically provided that any any registered voter had a right to address the meeting. All he had to do, uh, he or she had to do, uh, was be uh, introduced by a town town meeting member or, or town official. Is that and, within the scope of the article, Mr. Warden? Well, if you let me give give my remarks, it will be. Okay. Uh, I, I received uh, today a message from a a longtime friend, uh, former member of the school committee, and a former town meeting member. Uh, and I would like to read his letter to the meeting. Go ahead. Um, the substitute motion for article, uh, it's article four, isn't it? He got the wrong number here. Uh, the special town meeting submitted by Patricia Muldoon. Uh, uh, leaves residents and businesses along, along the bikeway uh, in a, I'm sorry, this is the light's terrible here. Uh, uh, as, as victims of neighborhood of night gatherings, uh, wait, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Mrs. Uh, Dr. Word to re read this. Okay. Um, can I just? Oh, yeah, you want to sit down? Can you also tell us whose letter this is? Oh, oh, oh yes, it's uh, jo George Buckley, who lives in Renfrew Street. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Patricia Warden, uh, Precinct 8. The substitute motion for Article 8 of the special I, I town meeting submitted four. by Patricia Muldoon leaves residents and businesses that abut the Minuteman Bikeway as victims of late night gatherings, ruckus, and shenanigans. The police department needs to be able to order non commuting people to leave the bikeway in the late evening hours 
it should therefore have hours of use set by the town manager in concert with the select board. The bikeway west of Arlington for the most part abuts much less dense development than in Arlington. Please oppose and vote no action on Ms. Modun's substitute motion and any similar proposals that leave the area without regulation. Sincerely, George Buckley of Renfrew Street. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mrs. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Roderick Holland. Roderick Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roderick Holland, uh, Precinct 7. Um, I um, originally supported the um, uh, Adam, Adam McNeil Select Board um, uh, Article 4, uh, really on the grounds that it was a step in the direction of um, the uh, situation uh, proposed by the substitute motion. Um, on reflection, I think that the substitute motion is a very, very good idea, and I rise to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Uh, Elizabeth Dre. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 8. I'd like to offer to my fellow town meeting members this thought that a bylaw that is not consistently enforced is open to be selectively enforced and may lead to the risk of inequitable enforcement. If we are not currently consistently enforcing this bylaw, then we do not need it. And I would ask you to vote in favor of the amendment and remove the hours. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Dre. Uh, Gregory Christiana. And um, uh, to speak name, to well, Mr. Christiana, can you um, precinct Hello? name and precinct, please? Yes, Greg Christiana, precinct 15. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mr. Moderator, is it possible for uh, Police Chief Flaherty or someone from the police department to speak to uh, any concerns that they have with this substitute motion as far as uh, like security, safety issues along the bike path? Is that in the form of a question you have for Chief Flaherty that you'd like to find out her opinions of those issues? That's correct, Mr. Moderator. Yes, Chief Flaherty, can you uh, tell us what your opinions are? Good evening, Mr. Moderator, Julie Flaherty. Um, so, his Historically, the police department hasn't enforced these hours. We would typically um, advise people when we come across them about the rest restrictions, um, specifically if we um, receive calls regarding some type of suspicious, suspicious condition or suspicious behavior or some type of illegal activity. And we've always kind of approached it, not necessarily with the enforcement mindset, but as a community safety, crime reduction, um, and public order matter. Um, with that said, um, I took a look back to 2017 um, at the calls that we've received after 9 p.m. on the bike path from the Cambridge line to the Lexington line. And um, we've had very few calls for our noise complaints um, um, in, in youths gathering. Years back, um, it was an issue that we would have um, people gathering along the bike path, but um, we, we don't really seem to have those those issues anymore. So, um, the police department has no issue with the article or substitute motion. 
Okay, th th thank you, uh, Police Chief Flaherty. Uh, so I have the same uh, procedural concerns that uh, Ms. Brazil uh, voiced earlier, uh, but I think what overrides that for me is that empirically speaking, like, like it sounds like based on what the police chief is saying, reporting, uh, this has not been uh, an issue lately. And if it is, and as Ms. Ms. Dre said, if, if, if it's not being enforced, there's also the concern that it, it may not be enforced uh, equally for all residents um, or, or passers through, um, which, which could uh, be, be a, a vector for introducing uh, a, a bias, for instance. Um, and so for all those reasons, uh, I, I, I'd say I, I stand in favor of the substitute motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christiana. Uh, Gregory, oh, excuse me, Robert Marlin. Uh, Michelle DeRocha has a point of order. Ms. DeRocha, what's your point of order? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my, my question uh, is one of reconciling the substitute motion with the language of the original article. Um, would the um, elimination of bikeway hours be within scope for uh, uh, the language of the original article if the town manager decided um, that that was the move he wanted to make. Well, the language, I find the language is within the scope of the warrant article. Um, it's not the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen that determines scope. It's the warrant article itself, which basically boiled down to, to extend the operating hours of the Minuteman bikeway. So I guess by, under my uh, view of it, uh, by eliminating the hours, we are just extending them to 24 seven, as opposed to some more finite set of hours. So I did find it within scope of the original warrant article. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we'll go back to Mr. Robert Marlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mo Moderator. Uh, Rob Marlin, Precinct 3, I move to end debate on the substitute motion and the article. Okay, Mr. Uh, Marlin has made a motion to terminate debate on the article and all other matters before it, which would include the substitute motion. Second. Mr. Foskett has seconded that. So first we're gonna take a motion, a um, uh, vote to terminate debate. Now don't just jump right over to the voting screen yet. Let's let Adam work through. And once we see the uh, vote screen, Uh, the voting page now, if everybody could mosey over there, not all at once. So maybe precincts one through seven, a couple seconds later, eight through 14, five, six seconds after that, the rest of the uh, town meeting members, seven through 21, jump over. So that should eliminate all of our uh, problems with um, people getting bopped off the system. If you can just please um, open the Zoom hands, the Zoom if someone's, excuse me, the raised hand feature on Zoom if someone's having a voting issue, uh, please use the raised hand. Otherwise, please use one for yes or two for no, and then cast your vote. This is on the motion to terminate debate on the article and all matters before it. So we have 199 members have voted. We have 43 not. Those 43 could jump on over to the voting portal and please vote one for yes, two for no, and then click cast your vote. Mr. Moderator, Adele Krause has her hand raised. Okay. So Ms. Krause, if, um, Let's see what you have to say, but don't announce your vote over the um, air. Just tell us what the issue is, Ms. Kraus. Okay, 
Okay, Ms. Krause, we've got your vote and we have recorded it. Thank you. Okay, for the last 10 folks, we're gonna give you about 15 seconds. Mike Ruderman, Beth Malofchek, Joanne Preston, Ian Thomas, Elizabeth Exton, Timur Yontar, Sherry Barron, Larry Slotnick, and then Mary Deist. And we're gonna give you another five seconds and we're gonna terminate voting. Okay, let's terminate voting, Mr. Korowski. Okay, motion to terminate debate carries by 92%. We have a 217 in the affirmative, 19 in the negative. It's a vote, I so declare it, debate is terminated. As soon as we run through the screens, we're going to take a vote first on Ms. Muldoon's substitute motion. So Ms. Muldoon has submitted a substitute motion, which uh, was circulated to everybody early this morning. Um, and basically Ms. Muldoon wants to eliminate the bikeway hours in their entirety. So it looks like we have one more screen to go. Now we're gonna have to uh, invent one, Adam. So what Mr. Krauske is doing is getting us an agenda item for the system. You can see the back end work. Ms. Muldoon has a point of order, Ms. Wayman. So you can bring her up. Let's find out what her point of order while Adam does his thing. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just wanted to, oh, sorry, Patricia Muldoon, Precinct 20. I just wanted to clarify I didn't want to eliminate the hours. I want to eliminate the restriction on hours, which I'm sure everybody got, but. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we just heard what Ms. Muldoon's substitute would do. So we're gonna submit that and enable voting. Okay, now we can see the vote screens so everybody can stagger your way over to the voting portal. Look, he has a database issue. So um, precincts one through seven, a couple seconds later, eight through 14, a little bit after that, 14 through 21. We have the raise hands feature up. If you have a vi issue voting, Please choose one if you want Ms. Muldoon substitute, choose two if you do not want it, and then hit cast your vote. So let's go ahead and get voting. We've got 177 have already voted, down to 65. So here's Ms. Muldoon's substitute motion in front of you.
Okay, there are about 10 folks left who have not voted. If you'll please go ahead and vote now. Beth Ann Friedman, Susan Stamps, Elizabeth Exton, Adam Patcher, Mary Deist, Brian Rarig, Pam Hallett. We're voting on Ms. Muldoon's substitute motion. So uh, we're gonna keep that open for about five more seconds. Three people, Elizabeth Exton and Pam Hallett. We're voting if we want to use Ms. Muldoon's substitute. Okay, let's close voting. Mr. Moderator, we're just waiting on entry of one verbal vote. Okay. Also. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, Ms. Muldoon's substitute motion passes 88%. We have 211 in the positive, 29 in the negative, and it's a vote, and I sort of clear it, and with that is now our main motion. As soon as we run through the screens, we'll take that final vote. And um, Serene, up, oh, she took it down. Zarina Memon has a point of order, Ms. Wayman. Ms. Memon. Zarina Memon, Precinct 21. Um, Mr. Moderator, I just want to make sure I, from what I read in the substitute motion, even though it's passed, um, that there was no $20 fine or no fine listed, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, so as soon as we're done clearing that out, um, I think Ms. Muldoon has made hers. We're going to take a vote on the main motion as substituted by Ms. Muldoon's substitute motion. So we have substituted, now we have to vote and make it the main motion. So we're voting to make Ms. Muldoon's the bylaw. Okay, so please, town meeting members, please go back to the portal page uh, in the same groupings, one through seven, wait a little bit, seven, eight through 14, wait a little bit, and then 15 through 21. Then please choose one for yes and two for no, and then click cast your vote. If you have a voting issue, please let us know by using the raise hand feature or calling Miss Brazil. I should have given you her phone number earlier. If you have a voting issue and want to report a vote, call 781-316-3071. So Ms. Stamps has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. Um, I don't know exactly what uh, we're voting on now on Article 4, because that's all about setting hours. And I think we just eliminate, voted to eliminate hours. So I'm not, I don't That's think right. So first we had to vote on whether or not we wanted to substitute Ms. Muldoon's um, uh, substitute motion for the recommended vote of the Board of Select Board. 
We voted yes. And now we have to take a vote on this select board's recommended vote as substituted. Oh, Same okay. Thing. I yeah. see. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So if everybody could go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no, and then click cast your vote. And there are about 10 folks who have not voted yet. Down to seven, Larry Slotnick, Karen Kelleher, Leah Broder, Lisa Blankespor, Diane Mahan. Lisa and Diane have not voted. We're gonna give them another 30, 20 seconds. Okay, everybody has now voted. So let's close voting. The motion carries by 94%. We have 228 in the affirmative, 14 in the negative. It's a vote and I so declare it. And that ends article four. And the next that will bring us to article nine as soon as we get through the screens. Okay, uh -huh. is Miss Stamps left over from the last time? Or did she raise her hand again? Ms. Stamps, you have another point of order? Oh, uh, no, you're on, uh, no, sir, I didn't, did not. <laughs> I haven't been elevated that high yet, I, Susan. I forgot, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we have the recommended vote of the uh, Election Modernization Committee. Does anyone on that committee wish to speak to it? So it's Article 9. Okay, Mr. Levy. Hi, David, David Levy, Precinct 18. Motion to uh, move the question and terminate debate. Okay. Second. We have motion to terminate debate on Article 9. And it's been seconded. So I have motion to terminate debate on Article 9, vote election modernization committee. To basically extend the life of the committee and make everyone voting members. So we're going to take a vote to terminate debate on that. Thomas Michaelman has a... a point of order. So go ahead, town meeting members, navigate over to the uh, voting portal and go ahead and cast your vote on the motion to terminate debate. One for yes to terminate, two to no, and then hit cast your vote. Uh, Mr. Michaelman? Oh, I was just curious since we had no debate. 
uh, how we can terminate the debate. Uh, because Mr. Levy decided to ask for it. And now we're going to see if we want to it or we're going to continue to have debate. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Barron? Ms. Barron? Yes, Sherry Barron, Precinct 7. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, ma'am. Sorry, I'm sorry. Don't worry. Um, I had this, Sherry Barron, Precinct 7. I had the same question. I don't ever recall that we terminated debate when there was no debate. So I'm just uh, thinking that might be an unnecessary step. I think so. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have the 39 people who haven't voted yet. Please go ahead and try and do so now. Um, and Mr. O'Connor has a point of order. Mr. O'Connor. I am here, James O'Connor. Chair of the Election Modernization Committee. I just wish to clarify that the vote was to change our name from study committee to the Election Modernization Committee to increase the size to 15, to, as you mentioned, the, to extend Jim, Jim. the voting status and extend the life to 2022. It was all four parts. Okay, thank but, you, but technically not a point of order, but I'm gonna, nothing. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Moderator. Okay, the last few people who have not voted yet, uh, please go ahead and do so right now. Just let's terminate debate on Article 8, 9. Adam Pretcher, Adam McNeil, Samantha Dutra, Elizabeth Exton, Glenn Carden. We got five people. We're going to give you 15 seconds to go ahead and vote on terminating debate. And debate is, <laughs> voting is terminated. <laughs> Please close voting, Mr. Korelski. Debate is terminated. It's eighty-three percent in the affirmative. One hundred ninety-five in the affirmative, and thirty-nine in the negative. That will bring us to the vote itself. So, what we'll be voting for, as Mr. O'Connor so kindly told us in his that we're doing a number of different things here, extending the life of the committee, changing its name, changing its membership role a little bit and going forward in that manner. So we're gonna now take a main a vote on nine. which had originally been on our consent agenda, but we took it off. So there's our voting screen. So please navigate over to the portal. Uh, take your moment to get there. And when you are there, please um, choose one for yes and two for no. If you want to do the things listed in the discussion in front of you, um, 
and go ahead and update the election modernization committee as please vote one for yes. If you don't want to vote two for no and then hit cast your vote. Okay, we're down to about eight people who haven't voted yet. Susan Weber, Dave Good, Carol Bean, Al Tosti, Beth Benedict, and Len Carden. Those seven, six people down can do it. We're gonna give you 15 seconds to vote. Adam McNeil and Len, you've got 10, five seconds, three, two, one. All righty, closing voting. Let's close voting, Mr. Kurowski. It is 234 in the affirmative, five in the negative. It's a vote by 98% to update the committee. Thank you very much. The vote and I so declare it. Again, that had been on our consent agenda, but no longer. Okay, that'll close Article 9, bring us to Article 10. Acceptance of legislation, Gold Star Families. Ms. Magliazzo, what's your point of order? Hi, Mr. Moderator. I was curious as to whether there was a recommended vote on this and, and where, because I was not able to find it. Okay, it, there was, it was in the uh, Board of Select, the Select Board's report uh, under Article 10. And oh, I see it. Yeah, it's to accept legislation. I don't know if Mr. Chaplain or Mr. Hurd wish to speak to this. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Hurd, Select Board Chair. This is an article inserted by the Select Board at the request of the town manager to provide a full tax exemption to parents or guardians of persons who have died in active service in the United States Armed Services. The Select Board strongly recommends positive action on this article to recognize the extraordinary sacrifice that our soldiers and their families make on behalf of our nation. The select board voted in favor of positive action, five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Peter Howard. Mr. Howard. Mr. Moderator, I've brought Jane. Um, I've enabled Jane speaking. I don't see Mr. Howard in the list. Okay. Oh, um, well, Pete raised his hand, so let's unmute Jane. Jane, is Peter yes. there? Yes, he is. Oh, okay. This is this is he. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Peter Howard, uh, Precinct 10. How much is this going to cost the town? Uh, I, from my understanding, it's only one family that currently qualifies. Uh, 
Mr. Chapdelaine, do you have a dollar figure for that? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, I, I don't have that one family's tax bill. Uh, however, I can assure Mr. Howard in the town meeting that uh, the granting of this exemption would exemption would be taken out taken out of the current uh, abatement overlay or the or the current overlay that we set aside. So we don't anticipate any new expenditure uh, on behalf of the town to be able to grant this exemption. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Uh, Leah Hyam, Leba. Leba Hyam, Precinct 11. I moved the question in all matters before it. Thank you, Ms. Hyam. We have a motion to terminate debate. Second. It's been seconded, so we're going to have a vote on the termination of the debate. Okay, so town meeting members, please navigate over. Uh, you know, the precinct says I called out before. When you get there, please vote one for yes to grant an exemption to the Gold Star families, two if you don't want to have that exemption, and then please hit cast your vote. If you're having an issue voting, either call Ms. Brazil, 781-316-3071, or use the raise hand feature on Zoom. Okay, we have 19 members have not voted yet on the termination of debate. 10. Excuse me, Mr. Moderator. Yes. Sophie Migliazzo has her hand raised. Okay. Yes, Mr. Moderator, I just see that there are four points of order, at least on my screen, that you're not addressing, sir. Uh, I was looking at the voting screen. Yes, I see that. Thank you. We'll have a, uh, well, since you're here, Sophie, whoop, she's gone. <laughs> um, so Mr. Quinn, Michael Quinn. Mr. Moderator, when you called the vote for this, uh, I believe you misspoke and you asked uh, what you stated was that we would be voting on the article itself rather than the motion to terminate debate. To be clear, are we voting on the motion to terminate debate? Yes, we are, sir. Thank you. Yes. So we're voting on the motion to terminate debate. I, if I misspoke, I do apologize. Uh, Ms. Broder, Leah Broder. Leah Broder, Precinct 1, I also heard uh, when you called for the vote that you were calling for us to vote on the actual um, article. So I, I, I feel that in order to be fair, there, well, people, we would need to give people a chance to change their vote in case they yep, thought they, they have. Were... We haven't terminated voting yet. So anyone who we're voting on the article 10 to terminate the debate, if you voted in a manner that you didn't want to, please go ahead and change your vote. At this point, Thank you still have that option. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So voting to terminate the debate. Thank you, Ms. Broder. And Ms. Migliazzo. Yes, Mr. Moderator, uh, just to clarify, I also, when you spoke, you mentioned that um, in the misspeaking, you mentioned that we were voting on 
and uh, granting an exemption to Gold Star families, uh, parents specifically. And I just, that's slightly misspeaking because they do already have an exemption um, on record and without debate, we can't discuss that. My understanding is we do not have such a, an exemption on record. Uh, Mr. Pooler told me we did. I don't. Or I should clarify, they, we don't have a 100% uh, exemption. They do receive a tax. So uh, I'll, I'll get that clarified. Mr. Hurd, do you know what we have any exemptions of that nature? Uh, Mr. Moderator, John Hurd, select board chair. I do not know. I'd refer to the town manager for that. Okay. Yeah, sir, I would. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chaplin, town manager. Mr. Pooler's actually here, and he could probably speak to what information he provided to Ms. Migliazzo. All right, while we get an answer from Ms. Migliazzo, we're going to close voting because everybody has voted. So, Mr. Pooler. Sir, I would say that closing voting, though, this, ha this demonstrates why we should continue debate. So, Ms. Ms. Migliazzo, you asked a question. I'm getting you an answer. It's a point of order, and it's really not a point of order, but I'm getting you an answer anyway. So, please. Mr. Pooler, do we have any such exemptions? Mr. Moderator? Yes, um, sir. Sandy Pooler, Deputy Town Manager. Uh, currently on the books, there is a, an exemption. Uh, it is worth about $500. I don't remember the exact figure, um, but it's a partial exemption. It's not the uh, full exemption from property tax payments that is included in the motion before town meeting now. So it is a different exemption. Thank you very much, Mr. Pooler. Okay. Did that answer your question, Ms. Migliazzo? Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna vote on the motion itself. The Warren Article 10 to accept the legislation for Gold Star Family Tax Exemption. Once we get through the screen. So the motion to terminate debate carries by 86%. 207 the affirmative, 33 in the negative. Is that a new point of order for Mr. Quinn? Mr. Quinn, do you do have a new- Michael Quinn, Precinct 10. I just wanted to clear on what we're voting on. Currently Arlington has a 100% potential tax relief for surviving spouse of a veteran whose death occurred as a result of service. Mr. Quinn, that, is that what that, we're voting on or is this- We are voting, Mr. Surviving spouse? Mr. We are voting on the recommended vote in the Board of Select, Select Board Order to accept Mass General Law 59C 522H to provide a local property tax exemption to the surviving parents or guardian of members of the United States Armed Service who died in active duty in service to their country. That is what we're voting on. So this is the parents. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Yes. So it's Article 10. We're now taking a vote to accept that legislation. If you want to accept that legislation, Okay, now Ms. Crowder has a point of order. And then Mr. Jameson. So we're gonna start our voting. If you wish to vote for this, please navigate over. And then uh, gonna have Please press one for yes to accept the legislation, two for no. Mr. Jameson, what's your point? Oh, Ms. Crowder, what's your point of order? Um, I just withdrew it. Thank you very much. Mr. Jamison, did you have a point of order? Yes, Mr. Moderator, Gordon Jamison. Um, I wanted a definition of local property tax. Okay, so I'm gonna refer everybody back to the sheets I sent out last week saying what a point of order is. I understand. And I think uh, Mr. Quinn's original point of order was the only one that really was a point of order. Uh, we all know what local property taxes are, Gordon. It's when the town sends us a bill and it says you got to pay ten thousand dollars to mail the money. Would it include commercial? It includes if the you should. 
I'm sorry, Mr. Moderator. You know, Mr. Pooler, let's humor Gordon. Does this include commercial property? Um, well, I don't believe it does because what it's applying to is uh, homeowners. You have okay. to be a homeowner. So that's an individual. Thank you very Mr. much, Mr. Pooler. Anything thank else, Mr. Jameson? No, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sorry okay, to, to uh, be out of order. Yes, let's keep our points of order to actual points of order, folks. Thank you. Um, and Sophie has another point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm going to try my best to phrase this to stay within the, the rules of points of orders. As, as was mentioned earlier, since there is already um, a partial exemption, a partial benefit, we're not modifying that. So I'm saying you're continuing debate, ma'am. No, I, I'm just uh, saying Sophia, when we, when you're continuing not, debate. But we're, I'm just saying we're not deleting a section. We're simply. Wait. I said we are accepting legislation. If we read the vote in the select board's report, now that you're, that you are continuing debate. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. He's taken his point of order down. We have 36 folks left who have not voted yet. If you can please do so now. Mr. Moderator, Janice yeah. Weber has her hand raised. Okay. I got kicked I got out of. Kicked out of, out of <laughs> yeah, I got kicked out of the portal. Okay, can you hit um, refresh anywhere, or can you refresh your screen by using the half circle? up in the upper left hand corner of your um, of your browser window. That should bring you right back in Janice. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, Janice, you seem to be in Zoom twice. You have two Zoom windows open. And that's going to be an impacting you somehow. Can IT call you, Janice? Do we have her phone number? Andrew? All right, Janice, you're going to get a phone call. Okay, let's, um, we have seven people have not voted yet. Janice is one of them. Maybe we can get a, a verbal vote from Janice. Give that a minute. Elaine Crowder, Catherine Radville, Lynette Culverhouse, Michael Stern have not voted yet. If you please will do so now. Okay, uh, let's just give it a half a second, see if we can get a vote from Janice. Is there a way to get that, Emily? We received her vote. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, everybody's voted, so let's close voting. Motion passes by 97%. We have 229 in the affirmative, six in the negative. It's a vote and I so declare it and that closes article 10.
And as we get through the screens, we'll start Article 10. Article 11, I'm sorry. Home rule legislation, Justin Brown. Okay, anyone wish to speak to this article or who brought to present it? Um, I will, Mr. Moderator. John Hurd, Select Board Chair. This is an article inserted by the Select Board at the request of Mr. Justin Brown and 10 registered voters to allow Mr. Brown to sit for the firefighter civil service exam, even though he's over the age of 31. Mr. Brown is currently 39 years old. Select Board voted in favor of positive action, five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, for, sir. Uh, Mr. Joseph Tully. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I, I know you've asked us not to ask if you can hear us, but can you hear me? Yes, I can, sir. Thank you. I apologize. I wasn't uh, certain if the unmute was working. Yeah, uh, just name and, um, name and precinct, please, Joe. Yeah, Telly Precinct 14. Um, I anticipated some opposition to this, having been through a few town meetings, and, and perhaps my concern was um, was mistaken, but I, I suspect there will be some of my colleagues speaking uh, in opposition to this, and I wanted to to uh, get my two cents in. So um, first, I'd like to say I don't know Mr. Brown. Um, I don't know his story. Um, I will defer to the select people that they have a, a reason for their five nothing vote, and I would I would respect that. But I've always found these. Uh, rules to be a little bit arcane. You know, not everybody knows what they want to do with their life when they're in their 20s. And, and some of us come to our vocation a little bit later in life. And I've never understood why we would want to prevent somebody from pursuing his or her dream the way the, the rest of us are entitled to with whatever our, our chosen field is. And I think some of, some of my colleagues will undoubtedly make the argument that uh, this is not a personal issue. It's simply the fiscally prudent thing to do, and they will uh, they will tell you why that is. And so I'm not going to make their argument for you, but suffice to say, I, I disagree with it, and I'll tell you why I think that misses the mark. Uh, first, as I understand the rules, there's no guarantee that Mr. Brown will be hired. Uh, a favorable vote on this article simply affords him the opportunity to be placed in the pool of applicants. If he's never hired, then this entire vote is a moot point and it really makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, alternatively, uh, should he be hired, one imagines that he is, uh, at least according to whatever metrics are involved, a better candidate than the person that would have been hired in his absence. And so I view that as a, as a public safety issue, as I prefer to have the best candidate serving our departments. Um, Secondly, I will tell you, this is my 27th year in town meeting, and I can say with virtual certainty that these articles are exceedingly rare. Uh, I'm going purely on my recollection, but I think there have been about maybe three or four in all of my time here. So the notion that approving this article is going to send us over some sort of fiscal cliff, I think simply doesn't have any uh, basis in fact nor does the notion that if we approve this article, we'll face an onslaught of individuals looking to change their careers in their mid thirties. Uh, I think to suggest that is pure speculation and there's simply no evidence to that effect. And finally, I would simply say, let's not lose sight of what this job is all about. It's a dangerous job and people like Mr. Brown deserve our thanks. They don't deserve to have artificial roadblocks thrown up in their faces. Uh, there's no magical reason behind the 32 year age limit. I suppose the legislator and legislature in its wisdom could have just as easily made it 36 or 29 or anything else they wanted to. Uh, so there's no inherent reason why Mr. Brown can't be an asset to the Arlington Fire Department. The only thing standing in his way is essentially an arbitrary rule. So I would ask my fellow members to uh, join me in voting favorably on this warrant article. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tully. Uh, Michelle DeRocha. Uh, Michelle DeRocher, Precinct 19. Um, looking at the language in the select board report, it makes reference to the, um, the civil service law as applied in Arlington. And I have a question about what it would take to change that civil service law. And is there something related to how it is applied in Arlington that is um, on the books such that we could have an impact and change that. Mr. Heim. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Doug Heim, Town Council. Yes, there is. Uh, the civil service law essentially offers a variety of options to communities. There are some communities that have no age limit. There are other communities that have an age limit to basically uh, oriented towards when you take the exam versus when you begin service. We could put a warn article on for the next town meeting if town meeting was inclined to revisit, um, revisit the rules for Arlington and eliminate or revise our upper age limit for taking the exam. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rocha. Yes, thank you, Mr. Heim. I, I would suggest then that we do so, that we revisit this as a, a law, as it applies in Arlington, and not as it applies to Mr. Justin Brown. Um, like Mr. Tully, I do not know Mr. Brown and I have nothing against Mr. Brown. However, I, I find it to be a capricious uh, means of making exceptions for individuals who have either the knowledge that they can request an exemption to, to this law um, and it goes against our our attempts to be an inclusive community. It looks like a special favor um, rather than uh, having laws on the books that we want to enforce and not make exceptions if people ask. Now the select board report talked about how in the historically these have been supported. So all the more reason to change the law for Arlington, if indeed this law no longer is serving the needs and the will of the leadership. Um, so that's all. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. Um, Serena Memon. Yes, Mr. Moderator, Zarina Memon, Precinct 21. I wanted to know um, why was a law like this put in? Does anybody know of the civil service a law? Um, I know Doug Heim, our attorney uh, for the town, had mentioned some things about no age limit in some towns and, and then some have limits and so forth. And we can revisit this law and so forth. But I just was wondering, does, does anybody know why it was put in first? Mr. Heim, this predates your time, but would you have any uh, estimate of why this is? Doug Heim, Town Council. I'm happy to answer this to the best of my ability. Uh, the fire chief or the town manager may have additional comments. Uh, at the time that the civil service law was enacted, there may have been, uh, according to my recollection of the select board hearing, there may have been more acute concerns about uh, the age of police officers and firefighters at the beginning of the term of their service. Mm. Frankly speaking, people are you know, healthier longer and um, we have a better ability to uh, gauge somebody's uh, physical fitness for uh, sitting, uh, becoming a firefighter than we may have had you know, back when the, this provision of the civil service law was enacted. I think that individual communities were afforded some discretion to decide how much control they wanted to exercise for folks over a certain age so that they could have some determination, chief by chief, for example, of whether or not they really had concerns from, a, from any number of perspectives about the ability of 
of somebody over the age of 32 to, to sit for the exam and potentially become a firefighter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyman. Thank you. Um, and likewise, is there a limit on how long a firefighter can um, be employed? I mean, is there an age limit on the um, on the other end of retirement? When they should be retiring? Is there a restriction on that? Attorney Hahn, do you know if there's an upper age limit at which a firefighter must retire? Sir Doug Heim, Town Council. I apologize. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, the manager or the deputy town manager may know. I can try to find that out. Okay. Um, Mr. Chaplain, do you know that answer? Uh, Adam Chaplain, town manager. I don't mean to continue to pass around. I know Chief Kelly is here. I, I'm not familiar with the mandatory retirement age, but Chief Kelly could definitely clarify that one way or the other. Hmm. Let's hear from Chief Kelly. His first time in front of town meeting. Good, me, uh, good evening, Mr. Moderator. This is Kevin Kelly, the fire chief. Yes, the mandatory retirement age is 65. 65? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, chief Thank Kelly. You. All right, I just have a couple quick other points. Um, and one was this, this um, article will be expiring um, if he, Justin Brown, um, gets us authority to take this um, test on June 1st, 2023. Is that correct? Is that what I'm reading? Yes. Okay. And um, so I do feel that uh, this this would be fine. Uh, we could pass this. I think that's fine. But I do agree with the previous speakers that we need to revisit this law. It's archaic with the current tools of firefighting as well as with the knowledge of health. Um, and I think uh, they should probably, I don't know if there's a sex limit, uh, not sex, gender limit on um, firefighters. I don't believe there's any women firefighters in Arlington, are there? Chief, Kelly. Chief Kelly, do you have any females on your force? Yeah, also, could we see if this there's any Adam, diversity? This is Adam Chaplain, town manager. I can confirm there is a there is one female firefighter currently. And okay. any Anything on Thank diversity you. too, please? I, I don't have, uh, I'm sorry, Adam Chaplain, town manager. I don't have uh, any diversity statistics regarding the staffing of the fire department um, in front of me right now. Okay, that's okay. We're, we're getting a little bit of outside of the scope of the actual article, Ms. Menon, true. so yes. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So I'm in agreement with this um, article 11 um, and I do think that we do need to revise this um, uh, of the upper limit of the exam because there, and I'd like to learn more about the no age limit which sounds how that um, if we can find that out in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank Moderator, you. this is Chief Kelly. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, I will answer that question. We, we currently have one female and we have uh, two Hispanic firefighters. Okay, thank you very much, Chief. Okay, so the next on the list, um, let's hear Dan Dunn. Mr. Moderator, I spoke, could you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you now, Mr. Dunn. You know, Mr. Moderator, it doesn't make much sense for me to talk if you can't hear me. That's why we keep asking you whether or not you can hear you. Dan Dunn, Precinct 21, I move the question. Ah. Darn it, Dan, you said way too many words, but I think it's okay because you're asking if you asked if we could hear you. Second. So, seconded. We have a motion to terminate the debate. And it's been seconded. So uh, Mr. Kowalski is going to bring up the terminate debate. Okay, once we see the voting screen, the um, precincts one through seven will go over now and for three or four seconds, nine, eight through 14, and then a few seconds later, 
15 through 21, go on over to the Zoom portal. No, excuse me, to the voting portal from Zoom to the voting portal. Um, if you have a voting issue, please use the raise hand feature on Zoom or if you wish to terminate debate and can't get through, call Miss Brazil, 781-316-3071. Press one to terminate debate or two to continue the debate and then hit cast your vote. Hundred ninety-eight. If you have already successfully voted, Mr. Moderator. Yes. Doug Heim has his hand raised. Okay. Mr. Heim. Mr. Moderator, I don't want to speak out of order. I had an answer to Ms. Memnon's question, and one, um, I guess it is a point of order that I'm not a town meeting member, so I can't can't make one. Well, we'll hear what you have to say. So first, to answer Ms. Memnon's question, uh, there are quite a few com uh, communities with no upper age limit ranging from Brookline, Cambridge, uh, Chelsea, and Everett to uh, Melrose, Newburyport, Peabody, North Reading, um, Needham. Many, many communities have no upper age limit. Secondly, normally, uh, I, I, well, I'd ask the moderator if, 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 if he recalls, I think normally we would invite uh, Mr. Brown to speak on make his own case at the town meeting. He obviously can't do that in this circumstance because he's not a town meeting member. Um, so I just note that, that ordinarily we, we might have an opportunity to hear something a little bit more organically from Mr. Brown. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, looks like uh, Brian Rierig and Scott Lieber have not voted yet. A few guys will vote. And Sophie Magliazzo has not voted yet. So a few three folks will vote. Give you about 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And we're gonna close voting on the motion to terminate debate. That's it, time's up. Let's close the uh, voting. Okay, uh, it's 92% in favor of terminating debate, 221 in the affirmative and 20 in the negative. Okay, it's, uh, we're gonna take the final vote, then we're gonna take our five, six minute break after we take the vote on the article. Okay, so that's it. Let's take our vote on the article. And then we're gonna take a break. Okay, so precincts one through seven, navigate over to the voting portal. Precincts 8 through 14, go ahead and navigate over. And then 15 through 21, go ahead. When you get there, please vote one for yes, two for no, and then cast your vote. If you're having an issue, either call Miss Brazil, 781-316-3071, or use the raised hand feature on Zoom so we know you're having an issue voting. Now we're voting to allow Mr. Justin Brown to take the firefighter exam. The civil service exam. If you want Mr. Brown to take it, vote one for yes. If you think he should not be allowed to vote two for no, and then cast your vote. And 
Amy Miller, Richie Gallagher, Mike Rudiman, Sophie Magliazzo have not voted yet. A few people would please vote. And we're going to give those three people down to three. 15 seconds to vote on this article. Michael, Richard, and Sophie. And that's time. So let's close voting. And that passes by 90% margin. It is 214 in the affirmative, 24 in the negative, and it passes by 90%. And it's a vote, and I so declare it. All right, we're going to go through the screens, but if your town meeting members want to take a five to ten, five, six, seven minute break, uh, and then we'll be back. Okay, so town meeting members, we're back. And that closed Article 11. That brings us to Article 12. Home Rule Legislation, Consolidation of Town Meeting Member Elections. And Mr. Diggins has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Actually, this is more a question of privilege and um, it's, it's two. Uh, and uh, it involves the, um, my concern about town meeting and the reputation of town meeting uh, with respect to Article 25, uh, because I understand the desire not to have lengthy debate and to stick to the tradition of handling uh, resolutions by just having uh, four minutes of, of each side, uh, but, it was the desire of the select board to really get the will of um, town meeting members. And given the nature of this question that can be reduced in ways that can um, misconstrue the will of the voter, I was wondering if it might be possible for town meeting members to submit statements um, that can get entered into the record to go along with their vote. That actually has, uh, that's a request. I'll entertain that request and get back to you on that. Okay, um, that's fine. But you know, my, my feeling on this, uh, we're way outside the scope of Article 12, but my feeling on this no, no, resolution this is, not, is frankly, wrong. this is a board of select, this is a select board issue and you guys punted by putting it in my lap in town meetings lap. If you guys, we have nothing to do with town hall and what's hung on town hall and what the board, the select board wishes to do with town hall has nothing to do with town meeting. We have very limited powers. They pass bylaws, pass zoning bylaws, and spend money. That's all town meeting can do. If the select board wished to have hearings on this, they could have had all the open hearings they wanted. They put it on us and tried to shift the forum from themselves to the town meeting where it doesn't belong in my opinion and this is why I've never really liked resolutions that have nothing to do with town meetings prerogatives. I'll entertain the, the uh, request that you've made to me and I'll get back to uh, the meeting on that next Monday. I appreciate but that. Frankly, I, I wasn't pleased when the select board uh, shifted this to us because it was not a town meeting issue in the slightest. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Um, Thank Mr. you, Mr. And I appreciate it. And, and, my, my, and, and I'm asking this now because I don't want to wait until the end of the night. Yeah, no, and, I understand. Yeah, and, 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 and we don't want to wait till the 20, till right. we get there. And, and, and here's my second um, uh, question, uh, uh, question uh, privilege question. And that is, the, I understand that we we're allowing the four minutes for yes and no. And I also I'm understand- allowing seven minutes okay, because seven minutes. the proponents had a seven minute video already prepared. So I allowed them to, I was gonna, I, I, I let everybody go to seven minutes okay. to accommodate their video. Great, thanks, thanks, I appreciate that. You know, Thank you. And, and, and so um, normally uh, abstains don't matter, uh, but I think in this case, uh, an abstain uh, sends a different message than a yes or a no. And so I'm wondering if it might be possible to allow 
be those who want to propose abstaining to also have seven minutes? No. Okay. Thank you for entertaining Thank you. that the suggestion. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Okay. Okay, let's try and keep things on the scope of the article. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, this is Jim O'Connor. Article 12, Home Rule Legislation Consolidation of Town Meeting Member Election. Mr. O'Connor is on the committee who introduced the article. Good evening, uh, members of town meeting. Uh, the Election Modernization Committee uh, conducted a collaborative survey with Envision Arlington and surveyed opinions of things that we should investigate and study. And so I'd like to turn over this article to Jennifer Seuss, who has a presentation on how we explored the, uh, the voting for town meeting members in the future. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh Jennifer Seuss, uh, Precinct 3, also a member of the Election Modernization Committee, on whose behalf I'm presenting this article. Uh, article 12, the Consolidation of Town Meeting Member Elections, uh, is a home rule petition. It was reported out favorably by the Select Board. So um, under our current situation, when there's a midterm vacancy, so someone can't fulfill the entire three years, that vacancy is put onto next year's ballot. So next year, there would be the usual four slots for a three-year term and then an additional slot for a one or two-year term. Uh, that can be fairly confusing to new uh, potential candidates. Uh, it also introduces opportunities for gamesmanship. Under current practice, you can lose a contest for a three-year term with more votes than someone for, who wins for a one or two-year term or, or vice versa which is undemocratic and doesn't reflect the will of the voters. So let's look at an example. Under this example, there are five people running for a three-year term, Raj, Kim, Keisha, Bob, and Curtis, and one person running for a three-year term, Tracy. And here's the vote count and here's how it comes out. Raj, Kim, Keisha, and Bob, who are the highest vote getters for the three-year contest get onto town meeting and Tracy, who's uncontested, gets on for the one year slot, even though she has 30 fewer votes than Curtis. Maybe she's especially controversial, or maybe there's some other reason. So under this proposal, all open seats are elected to a single contest. So there'd be five slots, and the top four vote getters are elected to a three-year term, next to any available two-year ter two terms, and so forth. So let's go back to our example. Um, here's the final vote tally, and here's the result. So Raj, Kim, Keisha, and Bob, who are the top four vote getters, get a three-year term, and Curtis, who is the fifth highest vote getter, gets a one-year term, and Tracy um, does not get into town meeting. So just some additional thoughts. Um, we already do this process when we redistrict, if we redraw the district lines every 10 years. Uh, everyone runs for town meeting again, and the top four vote getters get on for three-year terms, the next four for the two-year terms, and so forth. Um, also that it's, this is not an unusual way to do things. There are other town meeting member elections that work this way, including our neighboring Lexington. Uh, we think it's um, more democratic, it better reflects the will of the voters, it's less confusing, and it reduces opportunities for gamesmanship. Uh, so that is it, thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else, Mr. O'Connor? No, I wanted to defer the remainder of my time to Jennifer to uh, wrap it up. Okay, I can call on Ms. Seuss. Hi, uh, Jennifer Seuss, Precinct 3. Uh, I, I, we gave the positive reasons. I just wanted to uh, bring up some potential objections and respond to them. The major objection I've heard, which is an objection, is that it can sometimes be easier to get a new town meeting member to run for a one or two year term. Uh, the second objection is that there 
someone might run and not know how many years they'll be serving because they might only want to run for one year, but get the high vote. Um, and I just wanted to say that I think that these are legitimate objections, but I just think they're outweighed by the fact that we're decreasing gamesmanship, where it's more democratic, um, it's less confusing and so forth. And I think that once you get into a system where you have say five or six votes on a ballot, it, it's going to be less difficult to, to drop out mid, mid year if it turns out that you can't serve the entire term. It just won't feel as significant that something has, someone has to be recruited for that special slot. Uh, so that's it. I hope you vote favorably on this action. Thank you, Ms. Seuss. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Um, Diane Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'd like to move uh, to terminate debate on this matter and any, any items re related there too. Okay, Ms. Mahan's motion to terminate the debate has been seconded by Mr. Foskett. Okay. Okay, once we see the voting screen, so precincts one through seven, go ahead over to the voting portal to terminate debate on article 12, press one for yes, two for no. Uh, precincts seven through 14, go ahead on over now. And then a minute 15 through 21, head over to the voting portal. And then please choose one for yes to terminate debate two for no to continue debating the issue, and then hit cast your vote. If you're having an issue, please use the raised hand figure, fe feature on Zoom. And if you can't get a vote in at all, please contact Ms. Brazil, 781-316-3071. And Ms. Broder has a point of order, Leah Broder. Leah Broder, Precinct 1. Is there a way um, when there's a motion to terminate debate that you could tell us how many people are in the queue waiting to speak? I get the sense that my screen is not showing. No, nope, whatever thing. the screen that's on, the Zoom screen is showing all the people who are on the queue to speak. So everybody who's there is on that queue in alphabetical order by first name. So you see the speaking list, that's everyone who's there. And then as soon as the move to terminate debate comes up, we lose that. Yes, because we've, got, we've opened a voting screen. Uh, I don't know what happened if the terminating debate lost, if it would come back to the same speaker list or not. We haven't encountered that uh, eventuality yet. If it does, we'll find out. But Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay, thank you, Ms. Broder. Okay, I'm now voting on termination debate of Article 12. 228 members have cast a vote, 16 are outstanding. Okay, nine are outstanding. Jane Morgan, Mark McCabe, Sue Stamps, James O'Connor, and Peter Thompson all have to vote on the termination of debate. I'm going to give you guys 15 seconds. And time's up. Let's close voting. Debate is terminated, 81%, 192 in the affirmative, 
45 in the negative. Debate is terminated. Okay, as soon as we go through the screens. Okay, so let's take a vote on the main motion of Article 12 as printed in the uh, select report of the board, the select board's report to rearrange voting in the manner explained to us by Ms. Seuss in her video. So we're going to enable voting. When we see the voting grids, Please, one through seven, go on over to the voting portal. Refresh if you have to. Eight through 15, go ahead on over. And then 16 through 21. Click one for yes, if you want to rearrange the voting patterns. Two, no, if you want to keep things the way they are. And then click cast your vote. If you're having an issue voting, please use the raise hand feature or call Ms. Brazil. And to answer the former speaker's question on her point of order, the voting list would have come back in the same order that it was prior to the motion to terminate. So it would have come right back the way it was. So go ahead and cast your vote at this point on the article itself. If you want to do it, please vote one for yes. If you don't, two for no, and then cast your vote. We have six people haven't voted. Um, Okay, Janice Morgan and John Gersh, you have outstanding votes. We're just taking one second to manually enter in two votes that were phoned in. And as soon as they're ready, we'll close voting. Okay, looks like we're all set. Let's close voting. The, mo the article passes by 88%. We have 213 in the affirmative, 29 in the negative. It's a vote and I so declare it. That will close Article 12 and bring us to Article 13. As soon as we go through the screens, we'll go to Article 13.
The Article 13, Home Rule Legislation, Ranked Choice Voting. Uh, Mr. Hurd, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Hurd, Select Board Chair. Article 13 is in regards to ranked choice voting. Just a point of clarification, the Select Board originally voted for positive action by a vote of five to zero on this at the request of the Election Modernization Committee. The Select Board revisited this article last Monday and entered a vote of no action, five to zero on this article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. O'Connor. James O'Connor. James O'Connor, uh, Chair of the Election Modernization Committee from Precinct 19. Um, our committee uh, revisited this article and voted uh, shortly before town meeting to withdraw the article from consideration and made the same request to the select board. Um, we feel that there needs to be more time to educate the community, study the issue, refine our um, actual language of the home rule petition. And so therefore we ask for um, a vote of no action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, to let the town meeting members know, I've personally spoken with Mr. Paul Schlickman and Mr. Adam Foster, both of which had pending motions to amend. They have both withdrawn those amendments as a result of the select board and the election modernization committee. Second. Um, thank you, Mr. Foskett. Now, Mr. Timur Yantar has a point of order. Mr. Yantar. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Timur Kaya Yantar, Precinct 7. I'm also looking at the members email list page on the town website and neither the revised report of the election modernization committee nor a revised vote from the select board was posted to members. I believe this is poor procedure. Well, we're just getting, I was informed of this the other day. They didn't give us a written, neither committee or the select board submit, submitted a written uh, modification but because they were just doing a changing their votes to no action, um, perhaps they felt it was not necessary. And I think it was as a result of the ranked choice voting losing at the state level. Uh, I will take up your point of order with them. Uh, but at this point in time, we have nothing before us because everything has been changed to no action. So there's really, frankly, nothing to discuss under this article. Um, do you have anything further, Mr. Yantar? Just to say that because both the committee and the select board did not post their <coughs> notifications to town meeting, uh, I don't think we should be voting on this tonight. I think that we should table it and bring it up on a subsequent night when we can have a report in front of us that says no action, and then we can uh, let, let it go by. I'm being pedantic. I understand that. Oh, Okay. I thought you were making a motion to table. I was worried because we have a no action votes in front of us. Um, All I'm saying I, is follow I, the rules. Yes, sir. I'll bring that up with the uh, chairman of the select board and with uh, the election modernization committee. I'll bring your point to them. Thank you. Um, anything else? No, okay. Um, we actually have two votes of no action, so there's really nothing to discuss here. And unless you're confused on voting of no action, I'm not sure what Mr. O'Connor or Ms. Pararun have to uh, bring a point of order on. So we'll have Ms. Pararun first. I know I'm not saying that right. Pen 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 am, I, am I unmuted? Yeah, it's Kristen Pararun. I'm sorry, the, uh, Kristen Pararun from Precinct. I am new to town meeting, so my point of order is indeed a question about, about process, specifically yeah. the way that the online warrant is functioning in regard to the select board's changed recommendation. When I click on the online warrant now, I still see 5-0 vote by the select board. I don't see any reference to the changed recommendation to vote no action. 
is that to be expected or is that just a um, um, take the online process? From my experience, when the select board meets after their report is issued, they do not always issue a new report if they have changed their vote to no action. They just announce it at town meeting. Um, okay, that does make sense to me. Again, I am new to town meeting and I appreciate the clarification. I find the uh, electronic materials extremely useful. Mm -hmm. And whenever they are updated, I always notice. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so Mr. O'Connor, do you really have a good point of order or is your name just left over there? I do have a point of order, Mr. Moderator, and that yeah. is on November 12th, the Election Modernization Committee met. There's an agenda that was posted several days prior as per the open meeting law. And it did state that we were going to revisit our vote on Article 13 because we haven't met since that meeting, we haven't been able to post minutes of that meeting. And we intended to bring this um, matter before town meeting when it came up on the agenda because of the limited number of days in between. Oh, Thank very you, good. Paul. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, we have no motions or, art or motions before us, so we actually have nothing to speak. So we're just gonna go right to a vote. So it's a vote of no action. Okay, so town meeting members, please uh, navigate over to the voting portal, stagger yourselves getting over there, and then put, it's a vote of no action, so want, if you want to take no action on Article 13, please press 1 for yes, if you do not want to take no action, press 2 for no, and then click cast your vote. If you're having an issue voting, please use the raised hand feature or call Ms. Brazil, 781-316-3071. So one for yes, no action, two for no, and cast your vote. We have 22 members who have not voted yet. So if you'll please go ahead and vote. Mr. Moderator. Yes. Janice Weber is raising her hand. Okay. Let's get Janice up. Ms. Weber. Hi, Janice. You can speak. Second. It doesn't say no action on the screen, so it looks like you're voting for the the, the article. Well, no, we're voting on no action because it all the say that, Jan, I I know that Janice. We can't go back and change everything on the fly, but I've announced okay. it that it's a vote. It's a no action vote. Okay, I just wanted to make sure my screen wasn't messed up. Yep, Thanks. it's not. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so eight members who have not voted yet, please vote one for yes for no action, two for, I guess, you don't want to not take no action. And then hit cast your vote. Curtis Connor, Dean Carmen, Samantha Dutra, Lisa Blankenspoor, Michael Brown, Peter Thompson, Nada L. Nuoi. Have not voted.
Okay. Okay, we're just finishing off doing a couple of the um, manual votes. As soon as I get the all clear, we're going to close voting. Mr. Moderator, Timor yes. has his hand raised. Okay. Uh, actually, Stephen Leggett has a point of order. That's what I was calling about. Okay. Mr. Leggett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Leggett, Precinct 9. I'm puzzled. I don't recall ever voting for no action before. We always vote no action. And we, we always- We don't actually cast a vote though. We do it at town meeting. We usually do it verbally because uh, no action, we have, we have to vote and clear every single warrant article, even no action votes. So at town hall, we just have a verbal vote for no action because there's nothing else to do. So we're gonna, that's why it may seem like we never did it, but here we gotta go through the motions. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Mr. Leggett. All right, let's close voting. And it's a no action vote by 98%. 222 in the affirmative and 14 in the negative. And that closes article 13 and brings us to article 14. Home rule legislation, senior water discount. We have the recommended vote of the board of select board in their report that they want to have home rule legislation providing senior water discounts. As soon as we're done with the screens, Mr. Kowalski will move us over and we're gonna take uh, Nancy Bloom's point of order while we wait. What's your point of order, Ms. Bloom? Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. Mr. Moderator, I believe you, you said the numbers wrong in the previous Counting, it was, I believe, uh, four were abstentions and five were no's or something. I think you said- Oh, I did, I got it. I'm sorry, Ms. Bloom, you're correct. Five no's, 14 abstentions, five no's. Thank you for correcting me. Certainly, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, 222, yes, five no's on number 13. And Alan Jones had a point of order. So go ahead, Adam. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Alan Jones, Precinct 14. Um, is this an opportunity for you to remind town meeting members, I was speaking of Article 14, to remind town meeting members of the bylaw that says a town meeting member who speaks upon any matter in which the speaker or their immediate family has a direct financial interest shall first disclose such interest to the meeting. I think there are a few of us are over 65. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Very good point, Mr. Jones. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on Article 14. Um, Mr. Uh, Hurd, you have to speak to this. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is an article inserted by the Select Board to file home rule legislation to extend the availability of water discounts to a broader set of Arlington seniors. The Select Board voted in favor of positive action, five to zero. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Deist. John, you can unmute yourself. Um, uh, I am an elderly person, and uh, but we don't know who you are. John Dice, Precinct Thirteen. Ah, thank you. And as everyone well know, well knows, I'm an elderly, elderly person, and uh, it seems to me that it's inappropriate to uh, 
make me a special person uh, as opposed to those who really need relief financially. So I'd like to modify this article and take out the part about uh, an elderly person, elderly, elderly. Thank you very much. Okay. I guess, will you make an, a, a motion? Well, okay. Um, Ms. Mahan? Diane Mahan? <clears throat> um, th uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'd like to move to terminate debate on this matter. Any, any items related there too? Okay. I have a motion to terminate debate. Mr. Moderator, point of order. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'm unclear as to whether I was supposed to second what Mr. Dice said or not. Uh, I'm not sure. The, my understanding is that uh, you have to submit a, a, an amendment in advance. Yeah, you do 48 hours. And I wasn't even sure what he was um, asking if to make a valid motion or not. So I don't think there was anything to uh, the second. second. OK. I second Ms. Mahan's uh, motion. Termination? Yes. OK. So the motion to terminate debate has been seconded. And we're going to go ahead and take a vote on that. Um, I think we already heard Ms. Bloom, right? On her point of order. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, I'm all set. Okay, thank you very much. If you guys are all set, you can use the lower hand feature and then um, that, that clears the decks for us. So we're gonna enable voting on the motion to terminate debate on article 14. If you wish to terminate debate, once we get the voting grids in front of us, go ahead, one through seven, pop over to the voting portal. Eight through 15, go ahead, pop over there. And 16 through 21. Refresh if you have to, you should get your voting screen. If you have an issue, please call uh, Ms. Brazil, 781-316-3071 or use the raise hand feature in Zoom. One, yes to terminate debate. Two, no to uh, continue debating the issue. And click cast your vote. One hundred ninety nine voting, forty five have not voted yet. Thirty four. Down to 17 voting. Too many to read. We'll give everybody another second, then we'll see how they're doing on the termination of the debate. One for yes, two for no. Cast your vote. Okay. Uh, Courtney Ulrich, Marion King, Samantha Dutra, Pam Hallett, Lauren Boyle, Dave White, Tenuta Forbes. Pam Hallett, Lauren Boyle, uh, Stacy Smith, and Laura Tracy have not voted. If you guys go ahead and vote, we're going to give you 15 seconds. We have five seconds left to vote if you haven't voted yet. And okay, time's up. So let's close voting.
It's uh, 73%, 165 in the affirmative, 61 in the negative. If it's a two thirds vote and I so declare it, debate is terminated on article 14. That will bring us back to the recommended vote as soon as we get through the screens. take a vote on the main article as printed in the select board's report to authorize senior water discounts. And go ahead, one through seven, go over to the voting portal, eight through 14, and 15 through 21. Go on over, vote one, yes, to authorize senior water discounts. Two, if you do not want to authorize those discounts. And then click cast your vote. If you have a voting issue, please use the raise hand feature and or call Ms. Brazil. 781-316-3020. Okay, I have to refresh my page, see how we're doing. Uh, okay, 19 people have not voted yet on this article. If you could please do so now. All our verbal votes have been manually entered. You have not voted yet. Amy Lim, Lim, Lim Miller, Dave White, Sue Stamps, Elaine Crowder, Lauren Boyle, Courtney Urich, Lynette Culverhouse, PM Hallett, Samantha Dutra, John Ellis, Stacy Smith, Laura Tracy, Michael Brown. Please go ahead and vote. I'm going to give you 15 seconds. And let's close voting. The article carries by 96%. We have 217 in the affirmative, nine in the negative. It's a vote and I so declare it. That closes article 14, brings us to article 15. Go through the screens, article 15 is home rule legislation, retired police officer details. 
as soon as we finish with the screens. We'll bring Mr. Hurd up as soon as Adam brings up the um, proper warrant article. Mr. Hurd, do you wish to speak to the article? Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Hurd, Select Board Chair. This is an article inserted by the Select Board to file home rule legislation to allow the town manager to hire retired police officers in good standing to be special police officers for the purpose of performing details and any police duties associated with said detail work. The Select Board voted in favor of positive action 5-0. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. Ms. Dre, Elizabeth Dre. Good evening, Mr. Moderator and fellow town meeting members, Elizabeth Dre, Precinct 8. I'm uh, speaking for encouraging a no vote on this article. Last March at the select board's initial hearing of this article, I spoke and asked the select board to add language to prevent an officer with a disciplinary record from benefiting from this bylaw. At that moment, they declined. This fall, I reached out again and working with town council attorney Heim and selectman Kuro that, and other community members, that language was successfully added. And I sincerely appreciate the select board's willingness to revisit, that, revisit the issue because residents are safer and the article is better as a result of that work. However, after continued discussion with and input from marginalized community members in Arlington, and after more in-depth research, I decided that I could not ultimately vote to support this article tonight. And there's two reasons. The first is that there is no set or spelled out requirement that retired officers continue professional training on any subject, including de-escalation, anti-bias, mental health or trauma-informed care, or even weapons training. According to an email from Chief Flaherty, these officers will not be subject to Mass General Law Part 1, Title 7, Chapter 41, Section 96B, which says, quote, Every police officer on a full-time basis in any such municipal police department shall be assigned to and shall attend a prescribed course of study approved by the Municipal Police Training Committee for in-service officers training at such intervals and for such periods as said department may determine, which basically just means continuing education, continued professional training. Um, and furthermore, Filling this work need with retired police is a step in the wrong direction. It, if we pass this article, this article will increase the size of the police department at a time when the black community, both locally and nationwide is advocating for less policing, not more. So I would like to ultimately see the town explore shifting the responsibility of detail work from the police department to civilian traffic flaggers as permitted by state law and as successfully accomplished in at least 27 other Massachusetts communities. If town meeting passes this bylaw tonight, it will put a huge obstacle in the path towards hiring civilian flaggers in the future. Future contract negotiations with the police unions will need to then remove this very lucrative job from retired officers. And that will add a substantial hurdle to moving this responsibility from the police department and into the hands of civilians where it belongs. In light of that, I respectfully ask my fellow town meeting members to vote no on this article tonight. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Dre. Uh, Timur Yontar. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Timur Kaya Yantar, Precinct 7. This article is a request made to town meeting. Although the town has reached a collective bargaining agreement with the Superior Officers Police Union about using retired police for details and must bring this to town meeting for consideration, we are not bound by that. We are free to vote this up or down. 
Now, I realize that the questions about retired police being used for details, not about non-police flagmen, but this article is proposed because there is a need for additional personnel for details beyond active police officers, which means that if the article is not approved, the town will need to find additional personnel elsewhere. So through the moderator, I have a few questions that perhaps town staff could answer. Uh, Very good. Uh, is it legal to employ non-police flagmen for traffic and construction details in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? Uh, Attorney Hahn. Attorney, oh, Doug, here you go. Doug Heim, Town Council. Yes, it is legal to employ um, civilians for a similar role. I, I leave it to the manager or um, the deputy town manager, the police chief to go into further depth on that if you need to, but it is legal, yes. Thank you. A second, does the town of Arlington employ non-police flagmen for traffic and construction details? Um, Chief Flaherty. Mr. Moderator, I'm sorry. I think that's a better question for the town manager. Oh, okay. Go oh, here from uh, town manager. Thank you, Mr. Hein. Adam Chaplin, town manager. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, no, currently the town does not employ civilian flaggers for traffic construction details. Okay, thank you. Number three, please. Uh, if you can tell me how much does the town spend annually on traffic and construction details, and what part of the budget does that fall under? Chapterlane? There is no, uh, excuse me, Adam Chapterlane, town manager. There is no operating budget expenditure related to the wor work on construction or traffic details. Most of this work is paid for by private parties, the utilities or real estate developers who may need a detail to keep the site safe. When the town is doing road work that requires a construction detail, it is paid for out of that capital budget. It's always budgeted as part of the project and is paid for out of that capital budget. When the town bills an outside entity, again, such as the utility, we charge a 10% overhead rate for the administrative oversight or overhead that goes in to managing uh, the detail system. Okay, thanks. Um, just a couple more questions here. Um, is there a difference in the hourly rate between employing non-police flagmen and police details? Mr. Chaplain. Adam, Adam Chaplain, town manager. So under, I believe it was in 2008, there was <laughs> reforms made at the state level <clears throat> to further allow civilian flaggers. And under that reform, civilian flaggers were required to be paid prevailing wage. Currently, I believe prevailing wage for a civilian flagger in Massachusetts is $46.88 per hour. Currently in Arlington, an officer working a traffic detail is paid $51.58 per hour. Okay, so that's about a 10% difference. Thank you. Um, uh, again, through the moderator, but probably for the town manager, mm -hmm. uh, why does the town not employ uh, non-police flagmen? Mr. Chaplain. Adam Chaplain, town manager. I'll, I'll answer to some degree, but I would also ask if Chief Flaherty could further speak to this particular question. I would say first and foremost, it's, it's long been the position of both Chief Ryan and I know Chief Flaherty that having officers in the field working traffic details can serve as a force multiplier and enhance the ability of the department to be responsive to, uh, to crisis or calls. Um, I can't cite the exact examples, but I know the chief likely can, where officers working traffic details have been the first on site to apprehend felons uh, or uh, save people from life-threatening situations. Uh, Arlington is comparably uh, lower staffed in terms of uh, its police department on a per capita basis than most of our comparable communities. So having this force multiplier in the field has always been deemed helpful. Additionally, and, and this gets into a longer conversation, uh, 
it's been longstanding practice in Arlington and really across the entirety of the Commonwealth to have police officers work traffic and construction details. That work that they perform uh, in doing those details in some cases makes up to makes up uh, close to 30% of an officer's take home compensation on a year over year basis. Eliminating that and thereby reducing officers pay by that much would obviously be have to be part of a very serious collective bargaining negotiation and would likely require significant concessions on the part of the town in terms of their base compensation. So it becomes a very complicated matter to tr try to address to move to civilian flaggers. And I'd like to ask Chief Flaherty to speak to this um, with more clarity than I can, but I, I also know that the civilian flaggers are not allowed on all jobs. Um, I might have this backwards. I believe they're allowed on state road jobs, but not um, not other private details, but I think the, the chief could speak with more specificity on that point. Well, I'm going to see if Mr. Timor uh, Yantar needs additional, because he's butting up against the I'm end of his time. I'm running out of time, so yeah. thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to mention that if the town, if it's a means for police to supplement their salaries, <clears throat> if the town were to save money on details blazing flagmen, they could use the savings to increase salaries. So thank you for the answers. I would like to conclude by saying I don't see the need for this article. And I am not, I must say, I am not a supporter of defunding the police, but I would say also that if there's a need for additional personnel, there are other available means and they're, they are cheaper. I will be voting no. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Christian Klein. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I would ask if um, you could ask to have some clarification to section two and the last line of section five. These are either acceptances or direct exemptions from specific Massachusetts laws. And I think clarification in those regards would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Heim, can you... Uh clarify section two and section five for Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, Doug Heim Town Council. So section two references a whole slew of laws that are primarily oriented around, um, around not affording uh, any special officers the same rights uh, that uh, full-time officers have. So for example, Chapter 31 is basically the civil service law. Uh, these retired officers wouldn't be entitled to protections under the civil service law that full-time officers would. Ch uh, sections 85H and 85H and a half of chapter 32 are basically references to disability retirement um, for uh, police and fire, which again, these are already retired officers. Section 99A, um, 100, uh, and uh, 111F, all those things are references to uh, indemnification for officers, what we call line of duty, leave without a uh, leave with pay for, um, it's basically a version of workers' comp for uh, police officers. And then uh, chapter 150E is basically the labor provisions that provide for collective bargaining. So most of these things are references to, in section two, references to things that full-time officers, both in Arlington and other uh, municipalities have available to them, but because these would be retired police officers, they wouldn't be available to these officers, especially since they serve at the pleasure of uh, the manager and the police chief and can be uh, terminated or uh, not renewed with, that, with or without cause. Section five speaks a little bit to what uh, I believe Ms. Dre was talking about before. Uh, that's se uh, section 96B of chapter 41 of the general laws. These are basically um, training requirements. And I believe this these were referenced in the um, materials provided by FinCom. It, it doesn't apply um, to police officers, to detail officers, because they're not considered reserve officers or full-time officers under the statute. That means that um, they're not required to have all the same training as uh, a full-time officer uh, for good or for ill. Um, 
And uh, I hope that answers Mr. Klein's questions to your satisfaction. Mr. Klein? It does. Thank you very much, Mr. Heim. Um, uh, this is very interesting kind of information. This is the kind of information that comes out when we're able to ask questions uh, to the articles. There has been a spate of articles this evening where debate has been closed on either the first or second speaker. Um, this is not something I recall happening when we were meeting in person. And I would strongly encourage that although we are in a rush to get this done and we do want to see an end to town meeting, that the posing of questions and the open discussion of articles is a key aspect of town meeting in the town of Arlington and that we not take that for granted and we not prematurely end discussion on articles before us. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, Sanjay Newton. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Um, first, I wanted to um, just really support what um, Mr. Klein uh, previously just mentioned about not terminating debate too early. I think it's really important to have these discussions. Um, this evening, I, I rise um, metaphorically, I suppose, uh, to urge uh, a no vote on Article 15. Uh, Ms. Dre has, has made excellent points about continued training and the size of police force, um, and I support those rationales, uh, especially as Mr. Chapdelaine refers to detail officers as a force multiplier. Um, but I wish, wish to speak uh, this evening about a different part of this. Um, as Mr. Chapdelaine also pointed out, these details are um, not paid for largely by taxpayers, um, but we should keep in mind that many details are for utility work, um, which we do pay for as utility customers. Um, other states and uh, even some other Massachusetts communities um, manage to do very well with non-police flaggers, and I would much rather see Mar Arlington move in, in that direction. Uh, again, I urge a no vote and hope we bring non-police uh, flaggers to Arlington. Thank you. Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Newton. <clears throat> um, Bob Jefferson, Robert Jefferson. Bob Jefferson, Precinct 12. Yes, Mr. Jefferson. Again, I'm in support of this article. Um, a lot of what the manager said in regards to public safety, I think are valid points. Um, we currently quite often unfill details because the process now is that if they can't get an Arlington police officer, they need to get um, officers from other communities. As a lifelong resident of the town, I would much rather see police officers out on the street, more public safety out there, um, in the event that there is a situation from someone who worked with those officers and worked on the street for 37 years, um, quite often those police officers can help out in situations. And again, I think the police chief could answer it much better than I, but I know of situations where detail officers were instrumental in assisting um, other officers or assisting in medical issues and um, Right now, if they want to talk about changing something, that's not what this article is. And when the you know initial speaker, Ms. Stray, spoke about um, marginalized communities and reducing the size of police forces, uh, that's not what this article is. That's a debate for another day, which I completely disagree with. So I would ask that uh, you support this article. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Uh, Gordon Jamison. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, I have several questions on this article. Uh, could, could we have a better idea of what the need is and the number of hours that our officers are doing additional service beyond their 40 hours a week or 37 and a half per officer? Chief Flaherty, can you answer that? Thank you, Mr. Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. Louder, please, Ms. Flaherty. Chief Flaherty. First question is, what's the need? So currently, um, 
I can't hear you, Miss Flaherty. Yeah, we can't hear you, Chief. Uh, she has a poor connection. Maybe Mr. Pooler can help us. Mr. Moderator, this is Adam Chaplin. I can I can take a, a, a shot at this if that's okay with you. Okay. That's yeah. So if, if if we can get the chief back, she can certainly cite uh, hours uh, uh, on average hours worked. I, I do think a valuable data point that will partially answer your question, though, Mr. Jamison, is that the details regularly go unfilled in town right now, and we often rely on police officers from other jurisdictions uh, to okay. have to come to town. Thank you. Uh, okay. I don't, I'm, we're burning my time here while we're. I'm sorry, Mr. Chaplain. It's Thank okay. You. Um, is this part of the collecting bargaining agreement? Does it have to be passed or not? Yes or no? Adam Chaplin, town manager, our, our commitment was to bring it forward to town meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, so I still have more questions, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, so um, I hope the uh, police chief will take this in the, the um, intent that it's um, meant. So when I go by um, the details in town, my recollection is they're spending more time looking at the work being done and looking at their cell phones than they are at the traffic. Granted, traffic is not always busy in some of the places where they're uh, deployed, but I would be happier if we, were, if whoever is paying for this, if they were actually doing paying attention to traffic. Um, I pass through Lexington regularly. They do use um, traffic flaggers. They have special uniforms with traffic on them. They tend to be older um, men and women who, uh, who do that. And they do a wonderful job and they're very attentive. Um, that's the end of that, that part of my thought. Um, uh, I'm looking at the details here. Uh, no one after the age of 65 can do this. I do have a question about the second paragraph in section one. Am I correct that someone could uh, terminate from Arlington Police Department employee, go work for another department and then come back and, and do this in town? I would not be in favor of that. Is that, is, is that a correct interpretation of that paragraph, sec, second paragraph, section one, perhaps? Um, Mr. Heim? Yes. I'm trying to make sure I understand, uh, Doug Heim, Town Council. I'm trying to make sure I understand. The, the second, the second sentence, uh, Mr. Heim, of of the second paragraph in section one. So what that, Doug Heim, Town Council, that sentence has two clauses. They have to have been a regular police officer for the town of Arlington, voluntary retired uh, under the provisions. So um, they have to have served as an Arlington police officer and they have to have retired. Whether or not their retirement would allow them to go work in another uh, jurisdiction, that would be hard for me to answer uh, on the fly. I, probably, there are probably some circumstances where that could be theoretically possible, probably fairly unlikely. Okay, thank you, Mr. Heim. Moving on to the next page. Um, on the previous speaker spoke to the lack of training. If we, perhaps the town manager, if we don't have the chief handy, could talk to the training required for these versus regular officers because it looks like there is a lot of training and stuff required. Um, maybe not as much as the um, previous speaker might like, but there is some training. Can we speak to that? It's section five. Maybe Mr. Chapdelaine, since we well, don't have the chief. Well, the chief is um, Chief Flaherty. Got our microphone working yet? Mr. Moderator, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, much better, Chief. Thank you much very much. Better. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, I can start from the beginning to answer some of the questions that went unanswered, if that's okay. Yes. Um, quickly, Chief Charity, my time is burning. Okay, so we'll, I'll, I'll start with the questions that you just asked. We would require um, special police officers to um, attend training they are, they are first responders, so they would be required to attend first responder training annually at their own expense, as well as CPR annually at the own, their own expense and firearms training. Um, as, I, as I responded to Ms. Dre earlier in an email today, 
um, we would require them to attend any trainings that we deem necessary as part of their, du part of their duties of, as a special police officer. And they'd be subject to the same rules, regulations, policies, and procedures um, of that of an active member, um, where they're not um, subject to attend an annual in-service training, they would still be required to attend trainings that I or the town manager uh, mandated. Thank you, thank you, Chief. Um, did you have an hours, an average hours per officer uh, for active employees? So that varies per officer per week, but I would okay. say right now we're averaging um, about 20 um, details being being called in a day, and um, we're probably filling 75 percent of them. Okay. Um, Does this count towards their retirement? Um, as far as hours? Yes, does this enhance their retirement or is this separate from retirement wages? It's completely separate from retirement wages. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm still learning more on this article. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Mustafa Gvaraglo. Hello, um, this is Mustafa Baraglu, uh, Precinct 10. And I think um, one of the things I heard, I think twice now, is that we have unfilled details. And I'd like to ask why we're not using civilians to fill those details at this time. Uh, Chief Flaherty or Adam Chaplin, one or the other. Chief? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Julie Flaherty, Chief of Police. Um, the Code of Massachusetts regulations provides that civilian flaggers can only work on public and state, um, public, state, and municipal jobs. So there's no prov provision for private work um, at this time with civilian flaggers. Um, they're not used usually because there's not that much of a cost savings. And as Mr. Chapdelain had stated, Massachusetts is a prevailing wage state, and in most ca um, cases, Flaggers are being paid close to what police officers um, are making. Um, I think it was $46 an hour versus approximately $51 um, an hour. And uh, additionally, the ability to mitigate traffic um, is limited as compared to a police officer. Um, well, I guess um, I would take the 10% savings um, for anything that is coming out of our pocket directly or indirectly in the form of higher um, utility costs or other costs. Um, so I, I do think that 10% will add up over time. Um, and as someone that's lived in other parts of the US and has traveled around quite a bit, um, bluntly, I've seen um, a better and more attentive job with civilian flaggers than unfortunately I have with, uh, and I won't say it's particularly Arlington or anywhere else, but in Massachusetts, it was kind of a shock to see the level of um, attention at traffic details compared to other places. And um, I, would, um, I would rather we save our 10% or save our money. And if we have to give police officers a raise to make up costs or make a um, more competitive wage package, that's fine. But I'd rather spend the money for the purpose that we wanna spend it for and not indirectly um, sort of spread these costs out in a more opaque way. And, and my experience has been that we can certainly get good quality traffic control with civilian flaggers whose one purpose is to control traffic. Um, and I would vote, um, I guess, against this article. Thank you. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. Mr. Thayer, oh, he went away. I was gonna I move, ask- uh, Move to adjourn the meeting. Okay, here we go. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn the meeting till the 30th. Uh, Ms. Brazil, do you want to second that? Uh, Julie Brazil, uh, precinct 12, second. Okay. So I have motion to terminate, the motion to adjourn until Monday the 30th. It's been seconded. Do we have any uh, um, notices for reconsideration? Uh, the speaker's list will be preserved.
until next week and it'll come back up in the same order that it is. So it's gonna be preserved. Uh, so Ms. Barron has a point of order. And if anyone else has a motion for reconsideration on any of the articles for tonight, please raise a point of order now. Uh, Ms. Barron. Ms. Barron, did you have a point of order? Oh, there we go. I, Sherry Barron, Precinct 7. I was just going to move to adjourn. <laughs> ah, very good. Already done. Yep. So you can use your lower hand feature. I don't have one. Oh, it is. It's there. <laughs> I know it is. Yeah, okay. So uh, hearing no points of motions for reconsider notice of reconsideration, uh, we're going to close down the meeting for tonight. Everyone have a good Thanksgiving. We will see you a week from tonight. Uh, we did pretty good tonight. We got through a bunch of articles, but we've still got about 10 articles to go. So um, we probably have two more nights at this rate. So thank you all very much, and uh, we'll see you next Monday. Thank you. Thank you.